Good afternoon. I'm pleased to see you all back. Um, again, I'm Barbara Fry, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program, and happy to be one of the co-organizers of this event. Um, and it's my honor to, to chair the third and final panel of this public part of the conference, um, which is going to cover long-term implications, impact, prevention, and intervention. <coughs> Excuse me. We've had the benefit of listening to a lot of very interesting interventions, and um, this panel is really designed to take our discussions beyond the, um, the atrocities themselves, beyond the response to those atrocities, and to look at the more far-reaching implications of the genocide uh, through the lens of accountability, politics, activism, gender, and religion. Uh, what we are looking for in this conference, ultimately, is, um, is to take stock of what we have learned since 1994, uh, not only about the atrocities in Rwanda and Rwanda's response, but how has that information affected and transformed um, both Rwanda and the international community's response to genocide and genocide prevention. So I'm going to introduce our panelists who are going to speak from um, your right to left starting with Professor Lee Payne, who is a professor of sociology in Latin America at the University of Oxford and a senior research fellow connected with the Human Rights Program here at the University of Minnesota. Professor Payne's most recent book is a co-edited volume with Francesca Lessa titled Amnesty in the Age of Human Rights Accountability, which addresses the debate over amnesty processes, legality, and outcomes. The book is just the latest in a series of important books and articles regarding the efficacy of transitional justice that is in the production of, of Professor Payne. She is now expanding her work on accountability for human rights violations to address cases against businesses which are accused of complicity for repression. And today she's going to address that aspect of the Rwandan case. Our second speaker is Marie Berry, who is a PhD candidate in sociology at UCLA. Um, uh, Marie's dissertation is titled, From Violence to Mobilization, War, Women, and Political Power in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Beyond. During her time at UCLA, uh, Marie Berry has received several awards and fellowships, including from the Social Science Research Council, International Research and Exchange Board, and the UCLA International Institute. She is president of the board of directors of Global Youth Connect, a nonprofit organization that runs human rights training programs in post-violence countries around the world, including Rwanda. Since 2007, Marie has conducted over 150 interviews with women in parliament and with members of women's cooperatives and today she will address the effects of mass violence on women's participation in politics and community organizations in Rwanda. Our third speaker is Professor Samuel Totten, who is a professor emeritus of curriculum and instruction at the University of Arkansas and one of the leading scholars in genocide studies. Dr. Totten's uh, resume consists of uh, um, a long list of publications, and I should suggest that some of his publications, as well as Professor Payne's and some of our other speakers, are, will be on sale during the reception after the program today. Among them, uh, uh, forthcoming uh, is a, a, a book, First Person Accounts of the Darfur Genocide, also forthcoming, The Rwanda Genocide, Interviews with Survivors, uh, in 2009, Plight and Fate of Women during, during and Following Genocide. Also in 2009, Century of Genocide, Critical Essays and Eyewitness Accounts. During the summer of 2004, Professor Totten served as one of the 24 investigators with the U.S. State Department's Atrocities Documentation Project, interviewing black African refugees in the camps in 
outside of uh, Darfur in the Chad Sudan border region in order to collect data for the express purpose of ascertaining whether genocide had been perpetrated there. Professor Totten was a Fulbright scholar in Rwanda in July 2008 at the National, or for most of 2008, uh, at the National University of Rwanda where he developed a new master's degree in genocide studies that is currently offered by the National University of Rwanda. I will also mention that uh, Professor Totten is going to be uh, teaching the teacher's workshop for us on Saturday, for which we are deeply grateful. Our final speaker is Professor Jean-Pierre Carreguet. Uh, Professor Carreguet is an assistant professor in French and Francophone studies at McAllister College. He is trained in social ethics, philosophy, African linguistics, and literary analysis and theory, and he specializes in African literature. His research focuses on the 1994 Rwandan genocide in literature, and and in dialogue with ethical, political, and philosophical discourses. He is the co-founder of the Interdisciplinary Genocide Studies Center in Kigali. His publications include edited books, uh, The Catholic Church and the um, Genocide, and uh, I'm doing this because my French is so bad, we'll try the French for the second one, uh, Récit du Genocide, Traversé de la Memoire. It was more Spanish than French. Uh, <laughs> Professor Carreguet received his BA from the Institut Saint-Pierre Canisius in Kinshasa and his MA and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. And today he'll conclude our panel by speaking about religion and genocide, a theoretical task. So I'm delighted to um, uh, hear from these panelists. We'll follow the same rules of asking for 10 minute interventions by each to save time for uh, question and answer. So Professor Payne. Thank you, Barb. Um, thank you to all the organizers for what has been a very interesting, powerful event and one that's difficult given the, um, the emotional, traumatic experiences of the past. And sometimes when you come in this to this as an academic, it's a little jarring to be then very, you know, sort of quasi-scientific to deal with such a, um, with such a painful emotional uh, moment in time. I was asked to talk about transitional justice in part because of a collaborative Oxford, Minnesota transitional justice project that we have had going. This is our fourth year of tracking the transitional justice mechanisms used around the world and their impact, um, particularly in terms of human rights. Uh, for those of you, we've been throwing around this term, for those of you who don't know what transitional justice is, we define it as the processes designed to address past human rights violations following periods of polit political turmoil, state repression, or armed conflict. Um, I have been thinking about Rwanda um, in preparation for today's talk and also in listening to the presentations today and how in many ways you could say Rwanda is one of our cases that's done almost everything that you could do in terms of transitional justice and not only that, in innovative ways. So it's a very important case study for thinking about transitional justice but also some of the weaknesses of transitional justice. Um, in terms of these innovations, Gregory Gordon just talked in the last panel on the ICTR, one of the two ad hoc tribunals that was set up, so an innovation in terms of international trials for uh, human rights violations. Um, also the foreign trials, we haven't said much about that, but some of the foreign trials in Belgium would be an, an innovation in terms of transitional justice. The domestic human rights trials we, you know, is also an innovation, and of course Kachacha um, is a model, maybe not a model that's been um, implemented widely around the world, but a model for thinking about customary forms of justice and the kind of truth-telling that come out of those processes of community 
uh, community engagement with the past. There hasn't been a truth commission in Rwanda, and it may be that we should be thinking about that, what a truth commission could do that these other initiatives have not done. Uh, the memorials and memorialization that Nicole talked about, the commemorations and also some of the art film um, that Taylor presented this morning, photography and so on are part of that transitional justice process and innovations and the reparations programs um, as well as vetting, banning and lustration, uh, removing past perpetrators from certain public positions. Um, so. Rwanda has been innovative and it's also been extensive in its use of transitional justice mechanism and, and why it attracts scholarship as well as uh, practitioners' interest in the case. I want to talk about a new, maybe a new form of innovation or a new way of looking at innovation that comes out of the Rwandan case and that is corporate complicity. In, in the Rwandan case, corporate complicity in the genocide. Um, but I'll, I'll mention what we've found in terms of using corporate complicity in other cases around the world at the end of the talk. Like some of the other initiatives that, and innovations that Rwanda is engaged in, this is controversial. And so by looking at the Rwandan case, we can think about whether corporate complicity or incorporating some kind of corporate accountability into transitional justice is a good thing um, and what are the challenges in doing so, or what about it is good and what about it is maybe uh, dangerous in engaging it. Um, so thinking about accountability for corporate complicity in genocide, there are four types of corporate complicity. Um, there is the joint criminal enterprise <clears throat> in which corporations are involved as much as state forces and other non-state forces in the planning and carrying out of genocide. There's also conspiracy, there is instigation or inciting genocide, and then procurement. And this is the case that I'm hoping um, Professor Gordon can help us with how, whether this case around the providing of the machetes and small arms, the firearms, has gone to any kind of uh, justice mechanisms. I couldn't find any track of it, but I found some, I couldn't track it, but I found some rumors about it. So um, that would be a case of procurement and in not just profit making, in other words, but knowingly providing the weapons, in this case, for the genocide. I think for, for those of us who are non-lawyers, we can think of these terms as a kind of um, criminal intent, right? the intent to commit genocide or the aiding and abetting of genocide. And those are the sort of two main categories that corporations fall into, although in most cases it's in the aiding and abetting side um, when these cases are brought. Um, but Rwanda is important in its distinction from that, or at least its efforts to look at the actual criminal intent or purpose of, uh, of uh, the business that led to genocide. So Rwanda is important in connecting corporate complicity to transitional justice, partly because of this theory of instigation. Um, as one legal scholar notes, those kinds of cases are limited largely to the Rwandan tribunal, bringing those kinds of cases of instigation. Um, it's also been known in the, the Rwandan case, uh, business case, is the first of its kind first of its kind prosecution, uh, as was mentioned earlier uh, in the last panel, since the Allied Tribunal in Nuremberg in 1946. So this shows you how it's innovating around this issue. The questions I want us to think about today is should businesses' uh, practices, should businesses be held accountable um, in this process of addressing past violence where should this be the case? Why and then how should we hold businesses accountable? The answers to should 
is yes in some, in some cases. Um, and so that leads to the where question. Um, I don't think this is particularly controversial. Where uh, violence would not have been possible without the complicity of, of businesses, it's obvious that this is part of addressing past uh, political violence. Um, so when businesses are providing the legitimacy, the capacity, the ability to carry out extensive violence, and when businesses knowingly contributed to that violence directly or indirectly, um, then it seems like we move away from a normative, com a normative claim to a legal claim. Uh, the normative claim is that we would probably all feel more comfortable if businesses didn't do business with genocidal or repressive regimes. But that doesn't mean that it's Ill illegal, that they're cr committing a criminal act in so doing. But sometimes businesses cross over that line from a normative claim about doing, businesses, uh, doing business and into criminality. Milton Friedman once famously stated, this is from 1970, that the social responsibility of corporations is to make profits. Um, that is now a claim that is being contested widely, not just in transitional justice circles, but in lots of even business circles around the responsibility of businesses to protect, to respect, and to remedy human rights. So increasingly, corporate complicity is getting put on the table for transitional justice. Um, so yes, it should, in, and particularly in these cases. But the why putting them on the, on, the, you know, on the transitional justice table is also not particularly controversial. The idea is to guarantee, part of the transitional justice claim is to guarantee non-repetition. So by raising the costs of businesses doing, uh, getting, uh, becoming complicit in this repressive or genocidal acts is not a guarantee, but at least it may make businesses think twice about engaging in these kinds of behaviors. The other reason why we should think about transitional justice and corporate complicity is remedy to victims, particularly victims who are harmed directly or indirectly by corporate complicity. And businesses of, that have made profits from this have, in that sense, a responsibility, the remedy responsibility for those violations. We also can think about establishing rights based democracies that come out of these transitions with equality under the law and businesses should not be held uh, less accountable than other actors for these violations under the notion of justice for all and access to justice for all. But even more generally, thinking about creating global justice norms and the role of thinking about businesses in that global justice norm, this contribution to single cases like Rwanda have broader appli uh, applications to that global justice norm. And again, that idea of respect, protect, and remedy. The how, though, is much more uh, tricky. Um, because there's often a very blurry line um, between legitimate business, as I, you know, legitimate business and illegal uh, or criminal business in these cases. It's also very difficult to prove knowledge, um, but it's not impossible. And we know these from cases that came out of uh, Nuremberg and Holocaust. And uh, Rwanda is another case of how you grapple with the criminal or civil responsibility of, for wrongdoing by companies. There are other models, though, that we've found in thinking about corporate complicity and transitional justice. It's not just the retributive justice model. There are at least three uh, truth commissions, Liberia, East Timor, and South Africa, that have dealt with corporate complicity. Um, and truth commissions could begin to deal with the history and give an opportunity <coughs> for businesses to participate in 
in gathering the truth about the past. The voluntary reparations is another possibility, but when South Africa tried this, asking private, the private sector to contribute to reparations, they only got $100,000 in voluntary um, uh, contributions from businesses, so that doesn't seem to be a particularly effective model. And the, quite frankly, I mean, just to be, to be blunt, uh, these kinds of justice processes have the, have the truth-telling part to it, but also the legal sanctions that put teeth in it and really make them cost in the future. Briefly, because Barb has told me I have very few minutes left, um, the judgment in the ICTR in 2003 was against three um, businessmen who were involved in this media case that uh, Gregory Gordon uh, talked about. And the, the first trial, of, or the first sentence of 2003 were, were trials for genocide, for inciting genocide, for, and for conspiracy to commit genocide, as well as persecution and extermination as crimes against humanity. So it, lit, it hit like three of the four um, corporate complicity uh, criteria that I mentioned at the beginning. Two of the defendants ran the, um, the RTLM radio station, and the so-called Machete Radio, and one was the owner of a print media, Kangura, um, a Kangura newspaper. They were given um, life imprisonment in two cases in 35 years for the third. And in the ruling, Judge Pillay remarked, by, quote, disseminating hatred and violence without a firearm, machete, or any physical weapon, you caused the death of thousands of innocent civilians. The judges as a whole in ICTR um, said they found that the men, quote, used the institutions they controlled and coordinated their efforts towards the common goal, the destruction of the Tutsi population. They said that the broadcasts and publications did not fall under the protection of the right to freedom of expression. There's been a lot of debate about this media case. And you know, Scott Strauss in particular has thought that it was overblown, that it's not that there was no guilt and there was no responsibility for the role of these businesses, these media businesses in the genocide. Um, but he argues that moderate Rwandans were not persuaded by the media. Violence occurred, most of the violence occurred before the broadcasts. Um, violence occurred outside the range of these broadcasts if you track it. And also that the violence would probably have happened anyway without the broadcasts, without the corporate conspiracy. Um, he argues that media is guilty of hardening a position, but a position that already existed. And the question is, is that criminal? Um, the three defendants appealed, and this shows you the difficulty of trying to bring these cases. Uh, they were acquitted of genocide. The incitement of genocide dropped um, for two of the three defendants, and the appeals chamber held that hate speech could be considered to be as serious as other crimes against humanity, where, as in this case, it is accompanied by a massive campaign of persecution characterized by acts of violence and destruction of property. Um, so only one of the defendants was acquitted on the crimes against humanity. Their sentences went down from life sentence for those two cases to 30 years, um, and 35 to 32 years for the third. Um, some challenge these, this appeal process as weakening the possibility of bringing corporate complicity when corporate complicity was clearly there in some of the cases. And, uh, and, but the defendants probably don't think they got off so easily on this uh, case of corporate complicity. My time is up, but I just want to say, to put, it, put on the table, that the importance of thinking about corporate complicity is whether, I mean, the media case can be looked at as hate crimes rather than a case of corporate complicity. And I wanted us to think it, about it here as the business responsibility for this. Um, and I 
what I would like us to talk about or think about is whether this is a model coming out of the Rwandan case to think about for other case for other country contexts. We found 34 uh, initia initiatives around corporate complicity and transitional justice, but that's only in nine countries. Uh, the majority of these, 17 of them, are in Argentina, and they are exploring some of these models of looking beyond purely criminal responsibility and into some of the uh, even worker safety type issues and civil claims around corporate responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, for that interesting start to our panel. And now we'll hear from Marie Berry. So far, we've done pretty well on the audio-visual with a f just a few glitches, so fingers crossed. Great. Fabulous. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here today, and I've really enjoyed the dialogue that's happened so far at this conference, and I'm looking forward to it going forward. I'm going to talk today about women in Rwanda and about the story of uh, women in Rwanda since the genocide. In the 20 years since the Rwandan genocide, um, Rwanda's leadership has endeavored to fundamentally transform the country. There is much to be hopeful about in Rwanda. In the past decade, the country has experienced 8% GDP growth, rising standards of living, and progressive social reforms focused on ethnic and gender equality. Perhaps most famously, Rwanda has emerged as a global model for the promotion of women in society. Under the leadership of President Paul Kagame, today Rwanda has the highest percentage of women in parliament of any country in the world at 64%. Moreover, the government has created a series of institutions that protect women's rights and promote economic development, and girls now outnumber boys in primary school. This progress is particularly remarkable given that as recently as the 1980s, Rwandan women held no subnational political offices, lacked the legal right to inherit property or open bank accounts, and were prohibited from joining profit-making organizations. The success of these government campaigns to promote women has established Rwanda as a donor darling at the forefront of the global movement for gender equality, leading to a sense of optimism among young Rwandan girls, government officials, and the international development com community about the bright future of Rwanda's women. During the commemoration of the genocide over the past week, many newspapers and journals have heralded the remarkable rise of Rwanda's women in the country's recovery. In a foreign, article, a foreign affairs article just last, a couple days ago, titled The Rise of Rwanda's Women, um, Swanee Hunt proclaimed, Rwandan women have become a force from the smallest village council to the highest echelons of national government. Yet when I set off to investigate the high percentage of women in Rwanda's parliament starting in 2007, I came to find that there were two sides to the story of women's empowerment, and they're both imperative to tell. The first story is the one that's told most commonly, and it's the story that the government of Rwanda wants journalists and internationals to hear and report. In this narrative, Rwandan women have spearheaded their country's recovery and have reached astounding heights in their national government. Women have great gained critical legal rights and benefit per from progressive laws, granting women access to legal protections against gender-based violence, and so on. In interviews I conducted with 40 high-ranking members of Rwanda's government, I found much truth in this narrative. I spoke with many passionate and impressive women, who, many of whom had overcome unimaginable odds to rise to positions of political power. Through these women's stories, I found that women's astonishing rise in government is, part of, is part, in part a result of the genocide itself as women took on new roles and responsibilities in their households and communities after the violence. After joining small grassroots organizations, sometimes simply to cry or grieve together, many of these women found themselves in new local leadership positions they had never before imagined. One member of parliament described to me how she was widowed during the violence. As a housewife in a rural part of the country, after the violence she found herself hungry, without a home, 
and with many children in her care. She said she felt desperate, as the life she had known it was destroyed. But as she described it to me, she didn't consider herself a victim, but rather a survivor. She said to move forward wasn't a choice. It was an obligation. Either you do it or you die. Either you provide for yourself, your children, or others, or you die. She found comfort in joining a widow's organization. She soon began working with a small group that helped orphans in her community. Through that position, she got a job at UNICEF. She went back to school. Several years later, she was elected to Rwanda's parliament, where she still sits to this day. This MP's story exemplifies the narrative about Rwandan women's remarkable ascent to power. It is a story of resilience after un unfathomable violence and of opportunities for social and economic advancement in the new Rwanda. But there is also a second side to the story, which reveals that although tremendous progress has been made, this progress has inadvertently left many women, women behind. Though a handful of ordinary Rwandans have gained wealth and new rights since the genocide, many more ordinary Rwandans, and particularly Rwandan women, feel shortchanged. Among the elites I interviewed, there was a pervasive sense of optimism about how far Rwandans, Rwanda had come, and about how far Rwandan women in particular had come. But as I began to interview more ordinary Rwandan women far removed from politics, the contrast was striking. For many non-elite women growing up, they imagined that they could get a job, a good job, if they worked hard and got educated. But school was expensive and many were forced to drop out. Many got pregnant. Today, the vast, overwhelming majority of Rwandan women can't find jobs outside of the agricultural or informal sector. And the disparity between men and women here is striking. At least two in five women in Rwanda report suffering abuse at the hands of their spouses, but despite recent legal protections, they don't feel they have the resources or the power to seek help. Moreover, rampant government regulations provide an additional layer of struggle for those attempting to climb the economic ladder. Instead of optimism about the future, in over 100 interviews I conducted with more ordinary Rwandan women, patterns of hopelessness, the inevitability of poverty, and frustrations about the gap between expectations and reality surfaced. Last January, I sat down with a woman I'll call Yvette in the back of a noisy bar in a poor neighborhood of Kigali. At 24 years old, Yvette is a married mother of two. This is her neighborhood. She described to me how growing up, she dreamed of becoming a leader or a, a minister, a high minister. Instead, she was forced to drop out of secondary school after her first year as her family could no longer pay her fees. Constantly hearing about the government's promotion of self-reliance and entrepreneurship, Yvette decided to start her own business. She explained, I tried to use my thinking, my ideas, to do something that would keep me going and pay the education fees for my kids. Unable to afford the high cost of renting a stall at the market, Yvette decided to start a roadside business selling sugarcane and cassava roots out of, out of a woven basket. But she quickly discovered that selling vegetables on the street is illegal in Rwanda. One of the many reasons why many visitors to the city remark about how clean and orderly the city looks. Deemed incongruous with the government's desire of this clean, modern, and orderly country, plainclothes police regularly seized Yvette's vegetables and tossed them into the street. Sometimes they handcuffed her, dragged her to prison for days or even weeks. She has lost track of the number of times she's been arrested, but estimates it's somewhere around eight. She recently gave up selling vegetables in favor of selling clothes, because when police inevitably throw her inventory in the street, even a, quote, even if a car runs over the clothes, you can still clean them. There is no hope to get a better life, she explained, when I asked her whether she thought her situation would improve, whether someday she might have a more secure job. I don't have the freedom to work, and sometimes you are really hungry, and your kids are really hungry, but you don't buy food because you didn't get to work that day. Yvette is from a poor family, and she worries that the poverty from my family is following me, and I'm going to pass it to my kids. Yvette's story is not unique. I interviewed dozens of women who expressed their desire to participate in their country's economic development and progress, but who found that the lack of jobs and the government's strict re regulations made it impossible for them to do so. Solange, another young fruit vendor and a genocide survivor, explained, I am a single mother, I have one child, so if they arrest me, you can't imagine what happens to my kid. He is all alone. And sometimes you have to spend two weeks in jail if you can't pay. They cut your hair, you sleep on the floor, it is really horrible. When you come back after two weeks, you don't have anything. You have no money. 
So you have to borrow money from your friends to restart your business, and the cycle continues. While women like Solange and Yvette want to participate in Rwanda's bright future, there are few opportunities for them to do so. For many like them in urban areas, the constant threat of arrest and pro poor profit margins from these types of informal work is simply not a sustainable career. As a result, many of these women feel their only option is to turn to sex work, which is comparably illegal, but can result in higher wages and does not carry the same risk of having your inventory destroyed by the police. Women in rural areas face many different challenges, which I don't have time to get into today. But in short, despite the widespread celebration of Rwanda's accomplishments in promoting women, not all women in Rwanda are thriving. Signs that progress made by women at the national level will trickle down and improve the lights of these, these ordinary women remain painfully absent. These two sides to the story about women's empowerment in Rwanda mirror some of the debates about Rwanda as a whole that dominate journalistic and academic accounts of the country's recovery since the genocide that came up a bit in the last panel. While one group sees Rwanda as a shining example of development and recovery after the genocide, another sees the country as an authoritarian police state that is ruthlessly suppressing its political opponents while waging a bloody war in Congo. Of course, there are truths in both arguments. As I see it, our job as scholars is to acknowledge the tremendous progress that has been made since the genocide and how far the country has come and so much of the good things that are happening in Rwanda. But as we commemorate the progress that Rwanda has made, it is also our job to probe deeper and to look for signs of instability and dissatisfaction under the facade of gender equality and development in general. And thus, while we should celebrate the remarkable ascent of women in Rwanda's government, ordinary women's struggles reveal how discontent is slowly growing. And I think we should pay attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. We'll hear next from Professor Totten. I'm very pleased to be here today, indeed honored to be here today. I'm approaching the, uh, the talk from a little bit, uh, from a different angle. Uh, I'm not speaking about Rwanda per se, but I'm speaking about crises in the world today that are possibly moving towards morphing into genocide. There are a number of crises today that I think uh, the international community needs to examine and uh, develop a consensus in regard to how to address these. But what I want to say at the outset is this. I've studied genocide for the past 25 years and I find myself going through this very strange shift of thinking in regard to what David Sheffer re refers to as atrocity crimes. There are, as many of you know, there are many different names that have been used in regard to crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, uh, other types of atrocities. But it seems to me, and this is nothing new, uh, studying genocide, it seems, is almost a fruitless, uh, undertaking, I think, and I'll explain why. I think that what we see today and what we've seen over the years, including Rwanda, where we know the Clinton administration argued, and there are internal documents that have been uh, released, both they were secret documents at the time or marked secret, they were marked confidential, and now they've been declassified. They're very interesting to read. Individuals within the government at that time, and this is not the only time this has happened, and it's not only within the U.S. government, debated what was going on as tens of thousands of people were being killed. As you all know, in 100 days, between 500,000 and a million people were slain uh, with the most rudimentary farm implements that one can think of. And 
I use the numbers 500 to 1 million in light of the fact that individuals such as Scott Strauss have argued that it's closer to 500,000. The international community argues that's the UN and including the media. Almost every newspaper article you read about the Rwandan genocide, maybe outside of Rwanda, talks about 800,000 people who were murdered in 100 days. And then, of course, the uh, Rwandan government and Rwandan people believe that it was probably closer to or over one million individuals. But to argue about what these atrocities were while tens of thousands of people were being killed each and every week, literally, is a form of madness, it seems to me. And it seems that instead of focusing on genocide, because one does not know if a case is genocide until after the fact, why not focus on crimes against humanity? Because it seems to me that if crimes against humanity is the targeted concern, that is relatively easy to ascertain. Now the question is, of course, what is the international community going to do if they ascertain that crimes against humanity are being perpetrated? Will the international community, in fact, become any more active, proactive, in trying to prevent or intervene such atrocities or not? I think that's the big question. I think also the elephant in the room, so to speak, is the issue of realpolitik. There have been a lot of programs, and you're probably familiar with most of them, from R2P, Responsibility to Protect, to actual early warning programs that the UN has developed, to the Atrocities Prevention Board that President Obama announced the establishment of at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in April 2012, and on and on and on in regard to focusing on genocide today. There are very few individuals, I find, who talk about the critical need to focus on crimes against humanity, which you can ascertain are happening right at that particular time, and that need to be addressed if you're going to prevent genocide ultimately. There are scholars, uh, most of them are in international law. Bill Chavez, who used to be at the University of Ireland at Galway, is now in London. Uh, Gregory Stanton, who's at George Mason University. Uh, Bossi Uni, uh, who obviously is one of the most renowned international law scholars responsible for, uh, for pushing through, I believe, uh, R2P are arguing today that what is needed at a minimum is a convention, just as the UNCG is a convention on the prevention and intervention and punishment of the crime of genocide, that a convention is needed around the concept of crimes against humanity. And that's fine, of course, but it still raises the issue what will the international community and individual nations do once these crimes have been ascertained? It's interesting looking at the situation today. We have at least five cases where crimes against humanity are being perpetrated today. As we sit here, as I speak, there are people literally being killed in various parts of the world, and the world seems, meaning the international community and again individual nations, seems to be wringing its hands in frustration, not knowing exactly what to do or how to go about preventing, staunching those deaths. Of course, we have the case of Syria that uh, is particularly maddening to me I remember the first article that I wrote about the crisis in Syria and what really prompted me to write the article uh, was the knowledge that children who were protesting or the children of protesters were being pulled off the street and tortured in torture chambers in Syria. And the first time I wrote an article, 4,000 people had been killed, 4,000. 
And I felt guilty that I had waited until I wrote that piece, guilty that I had waited until 4,000 people had been killed. Today, that number, and we saw the number go up, up, up over the years, that number is over 130,000 today. And we know what the refugee flow has been. Uh, it's creating all sorts of problems in the Middle East. Uh, there are countries that are being flooded with refugees, and understandably, and now they're trying to handle that situation, which is now causing problems, internal problems within nations, Lebanon, uh, Turkey being two of the prime examples. So that's one case where we have crimes against humanity that have been perpetrated, but there are others. Interestingly, it wasn't early warning systems that people seem to talk about all the time that detected that there's a crisis in Burma, but rather journalists, in fact, who recently won the Pulitzer Prize for uncovering the attacks by the Buddhists against Muslims in Burma, in which buildings, homes, businesses, places of worship are being destroyed and people are being attacked on the street. Then we have the case and a lot of these cases, there's a little attention, but there are other cases where there's virtually no attention. Uh, one that has received some attention recently, primarily because Samantha Power, I think, uh, has taken a couple of trips there, and that's the Central African Republic, where people were being literally slaughtered on the streets in front of peacekeepers because the situation is so out of hand. And over and over again, pundits have suggested that that situation may morph into genocide. A peacekeeping force has been put in there. The question, of course, is, and we look back to Rwanda, is it a peacekeeping force that's going to have any impact, or is it going to be a, uh, a Chapter 6 peacekeeping versus Chapter 7 uh, peace enforcement? And if it's a Chapter 7, will those individuals, meaning the troops, have the mandate, a strong mandate, then will they have the manpower and will they have the resources to carry out the job that they've now been uh, assigned. Another case that very few hear about is the Nuba Mountains. Nuba Mountains in Sudan. In June 2011, war broke out in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. And basically, the reason that war broke out is that the Nuba Mountains people were cut out of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement that was agreed to in 2005, that ultimately resulted in the people of the South voting in a resolution, or I mean a referendum, to secede from the North. The people in the Nuba Mountains who fought with those in the South feel trapped. They're under the fist again of Omar al-Bashir, the president of Sudan. He's threatened them in this particular way. He traveled to Kadugli, which is the capital of South Kordovan, and he said that if the people of Nuba Mountains continued to disparage his regime, to call on him to give himself up to the International Criminal Court, calling on Ahmed Haroun, who was appointed governor by al-Bashir of South Kordovan, to give himself up to the ICC. Al-Bashir said if they continued such behavior, he was going to treat them exactly the way he treated them in the early to mid-90s, in which he basically carried out a situation that resulted in the people starving to death. I've traveled up into the Nuba Mountains three times, uh, most recently last year, and I can tell you for a fact that the people are suffering the entire spectrum of hunger. Most of the people I met were simply complained about having one meal a day. All right, you know, that's the problem, all right. Uh, but it's, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't a major problem, not the way that 
certain individuals were saying that there was starvation. But what I did find was that there were parts of the Nuba Mountains, particularly in the regions where people cannot move with vehicles, where you have to climb for days up mountains, who are literally suffering from malnutrition to severe malnutrition to outright starvation. I met the only doctor, a surgeon, in the Nuba Mountains, at the only hospital in the Nuba Mountains, and, he, and I asked him, I said, look, I've heard a lot of rumors about starvation that it's starting to uh, appear uh, uh, similar to what happened in the 1990s, and he said, let me tell you a little story. He said, we have young children who are so hungry, mainly boys, who have climbed up into trees and continue to climb and climb and climb because they're trying to reach leaves that they can take home to boil, uh, their parents will boil it, and uh, pound it into a powder and then add to sorghum if they have it, who have gone so high to flimsy branches that they've fallen down and they've broken their arms and such, they've shattered their bones in such a way that he has had to amputate the arms. And he said, this has happened time and again, and it's shocking to him that this is happening time and again. In 2012, and, and I know I just have a few minutes, in 2012, or a minute, in 2012, the United States government, I think independently, but I'm not positive, and the UN discussed the possibility of opening a humanitarian corridor from South Sudan up into the Nuba Mountains to get, to food, get food to the people today. There was discussion for a couple months, and then it, the discussion virtually disappeared like the proverbial hot potato. As a result of that, there are now individuals, citizens, for, mainly from the United States, who are carrying food up into the Nuba Mountains, illegally crossing the border and going up even though there's warfare in the area today. And I can tell you, the last time I was up there, uh, there were approximately 55 bombings by Antonov bombers. And what the people suffer is incredible. I just want to, well, all right, well, my time's out anyhow, but uh, what I wanted to do was show you uh, shots of some of the individuals who, were, who have suffered tremendously from the shrapnel, uh, from the bombs that have been uh, dropped on these people. My point here is it's a classic case of crimes against humanity or war crimes. Nobody's doing anything. Thank you very much. And I'll go through these very, very quickly. Can somebody do this for me? I, I tell you, I'm so inept when it comes to this. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> All right, just a quick shot. And I'm going to go through these really fast because I don't want to take time from the other speaker. Uh, just a quick shot of the Nuba Mountains. What do people do when the bombing uh, hits? People leave their farms because the farms are destroyed. The s stores of food that, they've, uh, uh, that they have in their homes, their tuples, that is destroyed. They go up in the mountains in caves, and they live in caves. Next. Yes. Uh, I also have to say I'm so blind I can't even see that. What is it? This is children in front of Oh. <laughs> uh, these are people who literally live in the caves. And I've gone by cave after cave after cave where people actually have their cots, their beds, and they're sleeping up there. They're so fearful of being out in the open because these Antonov bombers come in day after day after day and drop bombs. Uh, this is the group unloading food that they uh, carried up from South Sudan. Again, they're crossing the border illegally. They're bringing in tons of food dropping it for folks. They're bringing in not only traditional foods, uh, such as sorghum, but they're bringing in uh, a plumpy nut, which helps with nutritional, particularly uh, pr uh, nutritional needs of people who are suffering severe malnutrition or starvation. And what we found out is that even though food is getting up there, the people are still suffering from malnutrition because worms uh, that they have end up eating the food that they're trying to digest. Uh, this is a group I bumped into. They had just come out of the, uh, the desert fighting. I have to say, I don't know if you know this or not, but 
Uh, the past three or four days, the government of Sudan now are massing troops along the border of North Kordofan with heavy artillery, and they're getting ready, it looks like, for a major offensive, which I believe is going to uh, mirror what we saw in 2003, 4, and 5 in Darfur. <coughs> this is the sort of thing that uh, hits individuals, and it literally cuts their heads off, cuts their arms off, and uh, kills them right where they stand. These are guys just going up. You can see them snaking up. Now, all of these, most of these guys fought in the South, with the South. Uh, they have uh, weapons, as you can see. They've got uniforms, and they are now being joined, and this really is adding to the complexity of the situation, by the Justice and Equality Movement uh, rebels from Darfur who are coming over now and supplying weapons. Dr. Tutton, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. Yep. I'm sorry. All right. No, no, that's okay. Uh, okay. Can you, Look away if you don't want to see this, and I, I'll just sit down. Uh, these are some of the individuals who have been hit with the shrapnel. This is happening day after day after day. Tribes against humanity, not genocide. The question is, this has been going on for two and a half years. It's going to continue to go on. And now Darfur's exploded. Okay, I'm through. I'm sorry. No, it's no problem. Thank you. We didn't want to cut you off, but. Okay, we'll take a deep breath. And our final speaker, uh, Professor Karagay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> My presentation is about uh, genocide, how genocide and the religion, or genocide and the theology. Uh, I've been interested. I mean, uh, my f uh, my education is in uh, in Francophone literature, but I did do some studies in uh, theology, modern theology, especially, and I've been interested on this issue, the way of articulating religion and uh, uh, genocide for several reasons. Uh, I was just talking to uh, Sam Totten a few minutes ago about different perspective orientations of different organizations uh, called genocide associations. And we realized that there are kind of there are different perspectives, but uh, among them, some people uh, feel like when, you ha when a genocide happens, uh, you have to act, I mean, even if you are a scholar. So we have like perspective of some want to be activists. And there was also another perspective of people that say, okay, we are scholars, what you can do is just like a critical thinking about what happened. And then you have those different groups. But anyway, I mean, considering those different perspectives, but I think when we have to act, when a genocide happened, when we, or, I mean, when you want to prevent a genocide, in any way, there is always a kind of a theory, a firm form where we can articulate our action somewhere. And that's why I'm interested also on the theoretical aspect of uh, disciplines, like how disciplines can, I mean, address the issue of genocide. And today, of course, I'll be talking about not just religion per se, but talking about uh, theology, especially what we call African theology. And the second reason why I'm interested in this topic is also about the particular situation of Rwanda in 1994. You have like more than 90 people who claim to be Christian, and you have Christian killing other Christian also in some churches. How can you explain that? How, for example, morality or Christian faith can't, or religion, for example, can cannot uh, prevent the people uh, for killing? So that is also, for me, uh, another reason. And the third reason maybe is also about just studies, African studies as such. We have something happen. This is a situation that happened in Rwanda, but I think it's really a challenge in any discipline, especially when you're talking about lessons from Rwanda. It's like even people doing like political science, literature, whatever, and this remains a question for them. How this happened? How can we uh, address this issue of uh, genocide with which instruments? But yeah, so that is a kind of uh, questions for me that are really very uh, important. As we know, uh, from April to July 1994, an estimated one million people were killed in Rwanda. More than 10,000 were killed every single day for three months. 
And then this mass killing, as we know, was not the product of emotional reaction. It was systematically planned by the Rwandan state during that time. And there's some good people, and that is, for me, the big question, some good people in the ordinary life, scholars, believers, especially Christian, killed their fellow Rwandan. And the question, how could a country, being reputed a Christian, with a Catholic majority, be unable to resist forces of hatred? And the most important today, how our disciplines, uh, or maybe morality, faith, political <coughs> systems, touching the transform concrete challenges surrounding human tragedy. And what does it mean, never again? Uh, can we prevent a genocide? Uh, after 1994, uh, 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 many artists and the researchers have expressed difficulties in conceptualizing genocide. They have pointed out the limitation in attempting to render the experience of the survivors. And the researchers need to attend to the brutal realities of the genocide in Rwanda. And this is a radical challenge that calls for a shift in the ways of doing research in Africa. Policy makers also seem to implement mechanisms that respond to the needs and the problems of the Rwandan communities in a very challenging and innovative way. So inventing Rwanda post-genocide society be as a theoretical task in the sense of trying to build the foundation, symbolic indicators, of a new system that is with mass violence, and it defines the horizon of perspectives that breaks the logic that has welcomed various structures of violence. In 1998, African writers wanted to respond basically to the genocide that had just taken place in Rwanda by the duty of memory, that was their project, they said. But Rwandan survivors who appreciated the initiative did not silence the indignation at engagement that always comes too late. Where were you during the genocide? And that was the question of Rwandan to uh, run African writers. And the many painters, poets, playwrights, novelists, educators, musicians, journalists, legal practitioners, anthropologists, political scientists, philosophers, or theologians have pointed out the limitation in attempting to apprehend the genocide, which no other African country has known in so brief and a dense period. In the light of the genocide against Tutsi, so what I'm trying is like to see how, for example, if we go through what we call, Afri I mean, that's called African theology, ensuring how this discipline needs to endure itself with the tools and approaches that go in deep in the analysis of the African crisis and then covering the promises of the moment. I argue that building a post genocide society in Rwanda requires the rethinking of academic disciplines. Uh, and I would like, as I said, to focus on the African theology and how this is very important. I mean, talking about this. If you listen, for example, to survivors' testimonies, most of them, I really believe that like in any survival testimony, you have multiple voices, multiple narrative voices. And one of them, I believe, is like background of a Christian faith for some of them, especially they're talking about what they went through, but when they will go through, for example, reconciliation, forgiveness, then you'll see how this will come as, I mean, very present in the testimony. So, and I think it's so important, since it's important, how can we address that issue? But before addressing this issue of African theology, uh, I'm not saying like, for example, religion as a such can resolve all issues, but in Rwanda it's because expectation we have a Christian, and we can bring this case, for example, in also in uh, uh, Central African Republic, when you have a case of a Muslim and a Christian. So, uh, so you have a different factors. I mean, among them you have religion, but I'm just addressing the issue of religion. But even in addressing the issue of religion, I would say, it's also important to reflect on the notion of religion reason and the fragility of the human to so who is killing, who is a survivor in this issue, but you see how we are so fragile as a human being. So among the factors that make a genocide or genocide denial both possible in the banner, scholars often see the dehumanization of the victim perceived as an insect or harmful animal. But beyond the notions of banality or spontaneity, it's essential that we reflect on mass crime using religious categories. 
uh, when we think it is in this way, genocide proceeds from a logic that defines good and evil, and that allows killing without committing a crime. And I think that it becomes very dangerous when, for example, especially for Christians, when they can commit a genocide, they can kill, and for them, is not wrong. Not just in terms of manipulation, but just within the system, there is no such a challenge about in terms of morality that it is wrong. And I think it's one of uh, the aspects we need to uh, consider too. Uh, the, uh, uh, talking about uh, fragility of uh, the human, I think uh, it's also important to know that, uh, I mean, a killer as a such is a killer, but is not necessarily like be considered as a demon or absolute villain. Uh, we, uh, in 1994, after genocide, there was uh, a Congolese writer from Congo Brazzaville, and his name is Henri Lopez. He was asked, what do you think about what is happening in Rwanda? Tutsi, Hutu, Hutu killing Tutsi, whatever. What do you think about? And the question was just like, look what is happening in Africa. And he said, I'm just ashamed to be a human being. And I think talking about fragility of human being is so important to see what does it mean to be a human. And I think anthropologists or other people can have definition of being a human being. But I think there's also a possibility on looking about fragility to say to ourselves, yes, is a fact of being a human being or a human, but somehow, maybe, uh, there is, I mean, without denying that we are born as a human being, maybe I should also borrow to uh, Simone de Beauvoir in replacing women by human being in saying, you are not born as a human being, we become a human being. So, and this can become for us a challenge. So, okay, what does it mean to be a human uh, being? So that is one, uh, I would say, like uh, uh, one consideration. The second one, in the case of Rwanda especially, there was so what we may call, for example, the uh, colonial library. Colonial library, this is expression used by uh, a Congolese uh, philosopher in the right, Mudimbe, talking about the influence, for example, of what has been written on Africa and still have influence on people, on our work, whatever. And I think one of them, it would be like this idea of a myth, uh, the myth of a uh, uh, hermetic myth, for example, that is still present. People can say, okay, this is like a, a 19th century, we're talking about who's a Tutsi, who's a Twa, but is it something that is still very, very present, I mean, in terms of research uh, today. And this can decide somehow in a way of reading Rwandan society or perceiving the Rwandan society. Uh, and that is, I think, is very important to address it too. So after the two considerations, which means the fragility of the human and also about this archive genocide, the, uh, uh, the uh, colonial library, let's go now to African theology. Religious discourse should define itself as a theoretical task, as I said. Uh, if genocide or mass violence becomes an object of study in African theology, and which has never happened until today, so like having like a theology, especially within African theology, having it as an object of studies, uh, becomes an object of study in African theology, then there was a need to liberate, not to reject. Uh, what, for example, has been considered, for example, in Africa within Christianity, the theology from adapting or translating a Greek or Roman traditions and the mummified African traditions. So there was a kind of uh, perspective within Africa, I mean, different faces of African theology, and one of them was like a so-called theology of inculturation, which is still, of course, unpresent. So what you be do is just like what, for example, within an African society, that can translate the language of God. But and this theology, of course, is like they will use just the Greek uh, a theology coming from Greek or Roman traditions, or whatever. And the question is how this can really address the issue of Rwanda. So people who are educated in this kind of theology, then that is people, others will talk to Rwanda and whatever. So if this is not an object, or it's not uh, studies according to I just been told that I have 20 minutes. No, no two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let me just bust then just in two minutes I have to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so there was like a different uh, perspective. One is this African inculturation using like categories from uh, 
even philosophy from, I mean, Western philosophy to understand like relationship or, the, or to make like the discourse on God. And the second is a movement that is, has been influenced by uh, Latin America, theology of liberation from Latin America. And this, of course, Africans have been used this kind of uh, idea of theology of liberation, but it was especially in the case of South Africa during apartheid, and this theology was applied. And the third movement that is still present somehow is called uh, theology of reconstruction, and this has been initiated by a Congolese called Kamana, and for him, it's like now, there was no apartheid in South Africa. Then we are in a phase of reconstruction and so and trying to articulate. But if we go through all those different kind of uh, uh, movement or theologies, none of them actually, I would say, has been trying to address the issue of genocide. So, and I think since Rwanda is like 90% of people are Christian, and you have a people studying theology having influence on those people, there was a need of rethinking the discipline, uh, I mean, theology as a discipline, in using, of course, other disciplines. Up to now, any theology, especially in Christianity, is defined according to, is a kind of translation of Western philosophy, philosophy as a discipline, and this is, this is since the Middle Age, Theol uh, philosophy as a discipline into a language, I mean, the way of addressing God. And I think for now, with the case of genocide, then disciplines like anthropology, sociology, law, we, literature, whatever, will become very important in articulating a new discourse on theology. Thank you. Thank you to each of our panelists, and because of the different nature of their presentations, we've 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 uh, uh, we, we've got a different crop of questions for each uh, that has been sown by your your presentation. So um, we're going to come back to to Lee Payne, and there was a question which I passed to her, which is about the role of a company like Heineken, which um, uh, has a, a role in, in developing wealth in, a in a countries like Rwanda and other, uh, uh, and other countries where there may be violence. And so it, it raises the question of indirect complicity. Um, yeah, the question actually says, have you done any research on Heineken which owned the beer companies that fueled killers? So not just profiting from doing business, but actually aiding and abetting in the, com in the, in the uh, commitment of these of crimes, of criminal activity. I don't know about the Heineken case, and so this is very fascinating to read about. Um, and I'd like whoever asked the question to come talk to me about it um, after this, this um, conversation. But the parallel case that I do know about is one in Argentina that's really similar. It's the provision uh, by a company of earplugs to torturers so that they could torture without being harmed as much, to not have to hear the screams of those they were torturing. And this is one of the 17 cases that's being brought in Argentina and very similar in the sense that they're not committing the crime directly, but they're aiding and facilitating the the torture of, of victims in the clandestine torture centers. Great. Um, Marie, there's a, a couple different questions I want to direct towards you. Um, one, we th I thought you might have the answer to this. Somebody is asking, what's the percentage of those in parliament who are Hutu? Do you happen to know? Well, no, um, because the there's, there's, it's really not something that you talk about in Rwanda today. It's, it's not appropriate to ask. It's not legal to ask. I know that in my interview sample, I interviewed 25 of the 45 women in parliament. I know how many in my interview sample were who do, um, just based on their, their, their stories. But I don't put that in my, my research. You know, I tried to leave that out. It's, it's extremely sensitive, and it's, it's a. Uh, yeah, I would say I would say I'll say that there are Hutus in Parliament. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thanks for helping us with that. Can I say something about sure, this question? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, 
I think after 1994, especially in Rwanda, they didn't uh, say, okay, there was no Hutu, or there was no Tutsi. They recognized that we have Tutsi, we have a Hutu, whatever. But what Rwandan or Rwandan government, whatever, uh, what Rwandan they don't want is to consider Tutsi Hutu as a public category that will have importance, for example, or that will be relevant. So it can be Hutu and the Tutsi, but within, like, uh, uh, I would say, uh, within a, a private sphere. You are Hutu, you are Tutsi, whatever. But it will not be important, I mean, irrelevant. Like, because in the past, it was like something legal category. To be Hutu, to be Tutsi, how many in education, and they have to go through that. But I think maybe in the future, the next step would be then to banalize that. So it's like someone saying, I'm a Hutu or Tutsi, so there is no such a Hun. But you know, just 20 years this happened, and not just 20 years, but this has been built since 19th century, going back to this idea of lib uh, uh, colonial lib library. So I think it will take time. And then I think the most important to be when. So I think it will be not to suppress the idea of, I mean, be called the Hutu and the Tutsi, but to banalize that. But it will take time. Thank you. Um, Marie, there are a few questions here that are trying to um, address the tensions between the two groups of women that you've identified. So, um, and to what extent are the women in power aware of the problems being suffered by, by the other women who are so economically challenged and are there, you know, it, if you could just explain the, that, that relationship, I think it would be interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that I'm, I don't have a great answer to. Um, I, as many of you I'm sure have done, had spent time in Rwanda and have, you know, are from Rwanda, have lived in Rwanda for periods of time, um, perhaps you've had a similar impression, which is that it seems almost like there are two worlds in the country. There is the world that you find at the Serena Hotel and the world in um, the um, Rwanda in, you know, University Women Network and uh, the world in Parliament. and. Um, and then it feels like there's another world. When you leave, leave the, the pr pristine cities in the capital, you go down the hills, you go um, further off the, the paved road or the, or the, or the um, dirt road. And the further and further you go, I feel like the more and more it's a different world. And um, there are many women in parliament that are completely aware of, of the fact that this, this divide exists. There are many women that, and men that, that, are, that are aware of this and would like this to change. Um, there isn't an easy answer, of course, but this is more than just a story about the haves and the have-nots. Um, and I think it's an important story to recognize how efforts that are intended to remedy women's subjugation have actually reinforced women's subjugation in many ways in Rwanda. Um, and this goes back to, and you know, my, my ap approach to this is very rooted in the feminist literature, looking at, well, there's a big difference between granting women rights um, and giving them access to resources, between that and giving women control over those very same resources. And what I understand in Rwanda is that the majority of women there today have not been um, able to gain control over the new rights that they've, they've won at the national political level and at the legal level. Um, and I certainly think there is an awareness, but I do think, um, in general, the, the, that many of the elite live lives that are very, very different from the rural poor in particular, um, and don't necessarily understand the hardship. I, I've mentioned multiple times to, um, to more elite women, you know, it's really, I think very, um, it was very horrifying to me to discover how brutally women that are trying to make a living are treated by the state. And, and my, the response from some women was, yes, I agree. That's, that, that needs to stop. You know, some of that's not even, they're not even aware of that at the very top level. But then the other response was, well, those that, you know, they need to, they need to work harder and get better jobs. They need to clean up their act. They need, it's all about their own agency. And the way that I see it is these women do not have choices and they don't have choices to clean up their act. And particularly with sex workers, they're engaging in this form of labor and this form of work, not out of a, um, um, not out of some sort of moral failing or some sort of, um, you know, uh, because they're promiscuous. They're engaging in this because they're desperate and they need to feed their kids. Um, and I think there's some awareness of that at, at the elite level, but there's certainly not as much as there needs to be for there to be any sort of systemic change. 
So here, here's a question for all of us. I think it kind of got left to us as the last panel of the day because it, because we started the day with 1994, we missed the entire history um, leading up to 1994. So we have a couple questions here that have to deal with the role of colonialism. So I, I guess I would just, um, you know, I think that it would be interesting, each of you might have a, uh, a, a kind of interesting perspective in that. Um, take it from what starting point you want. Um, uh, maybe what, what is the role of colonialism in this debate as we move forward in Rwanda? And um, maybe the question of, you know, since we know that this is an issue in, in current, um, uh, in, in current genocides, genocidal situations as well, you know, is, is it, um, uh, raise the stakes for the uh, the colonial powers in some way. Um, I'll leave it at that. See who wants to pick it up and start it. Jean Pierre, would you like to start with um, your you ra you you did discuss a little bit colonialism, mm -hmm. but what what's what role should it have in this debate as we move forward on Rwanda? Yeah, this is a. Uh I mean, it's a big question. <laughs> uh, when people, uh, I mean, generally talking about Rwanda, Africa, talk about so what people call like post-colonial studies, uh, one of the questions is, what does it mean, post-colonial studies? Do we consider as, I mean, in terms of historical, like a moment, or do we consider like in terms of a topic and name situation? Yeah, especially case of Rwanda or other African countries colonized by France or France or so, I mean Belgium, but especially France, people still believe that there was just transformation of what we call colonialism situation. And that is expression, for example, of France Afrique talking about the case. So people still, even until, I mean, uh, it at any level, you can take political level, still feel like, especially Africa and the Europe, there was so such presence, somehow in a different way, economic way, politics, whatever. And it becomes very difficult to talk about period after. I mean, so colonialism as ideology would say, yes, it's still there somehow. And that's, as I started with this idea of post-colonial studies. Uh, and I think talking about theoretical task, I mean, for me, uh, and I think this is still also present in our, the way disciplines have been built in a way of addressing some issues. And I think is uh, still a challenge, that's I would say, yeah. Mm. Any other comments among the panelists? Go ahead. What I'd add in regard to uh, current Rwanda is I've heard over and over again from Rwandans, uh, both in Rwanda as well as in Europe, that uh, certain Rwandans are very concerned about what they're referring to as neo-colonialism. Uh, a couple of different examples. I mean, I was at the, uh, I was at the 10th commemoration of the uh, Rwandan genocide, uh, which was held in Kigali in the big stadium. And at that time, uh, Paul Kagame, I mean, pretty much alluded to that. And uh, it was very interesting hearing him speak because he was quite angry about uh, what human rights activists, uh, governments were saying in regard to the human rights situation in uh, Rwanda. And he said, this is almost a verbatim quote, they weren't here when all of the people were being killed and they're not going to tell us now how to run our country. Uh, just this past week, I was in uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden, and I heard uh, a number of statements from Rwandans that they even think the fact that there are so many NGOs and activists, um, humanitarian aid workers, uh, whatever, in uh, Rwanda today, and I don't mean humanitarian aid in the sense of obviously refugee camps, but going in and helping in various ways, uh, saying that, hey, this is, it, this is a, a Rwanda, Rwandan issue and the Rwandans can do it themselves. Why does the outside world think that they have all of the answers? Uh, I mean, it's interesting to hear people talking about, well, maybe we ought to do this in Rwanda. Maybe we ought to do this. Um, it might be wise to 
you know, let the Rwandans work on these issues and, and confer with them, obviously, and help them. But to dictate what to do and how to do it, I don't think is wise. And I don't think Rwandans welcome that at this particular stage. Um, yeah, I just was, I think that this is part of the history and some of the roots, the root causes of violence that it's almost impossible to get at through prosecutorial efforts and really has to involve some kind of truth gathering investigation of the colonial roots of the violence. Um, and why I was saying at the beginning of the presentation that maybe a truth commission model, even 20 years after, would be appropriate to try and untangle some of these root causes uh, instead of just the, the justice, um, the, the retributive justice model. And in terms of the corporate complicity cases, um, it is a little maybe uh, surprising that the only cases that are pursued are Rwandan businesses and not multinational businesses that were, were complicit in some of the violence, like the, the provision of, of uh, machetes and, and small arms in particular, firearms in particular that came from France and Belgium. Um, so that that would be a new way. Not, it's not exactly colonial, but it is looking at these kinds of uh, colonial process of extraction that continues um, even into the contemporary era. Great. Um, Professor Tott and I have a whole stack of questions here. Great. <laughs> but they basically sum up to this question, which is, what should we do in the Nuba Mountains? Or any other situation that- Well, as far as the Nuba Mountains, somebody ought to really start uh, doing something more than uh, placating, it seems, to a large extent, Al-Bashir. Uh, I think the problem with that is, is that uh, certain members of the international community have vested interest in Rwanda and certainly at least three members of the uh, P5 of the UN Security Council. Uh, it's the same situation we saw in Darfur. The, uh, the Chinese, uh, they're, they're pulling huge amounts of petroleum out of, uh, out of Sudan and they're selling weapons. Uh, you have Russia selling weapons and the early on during the Darfur crisis, the, the word that was out regarding the United States is, well, uh, al-Bashir is allowing the United States to track terrorists through uh, in Sudan that are even, either residing there or, or traveling through. Uh, the word out now is, is that the United States has dr small, tiny drone bases dotted all over Sudan. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was true, but the last time I was in... Um, in the Nuba Mountains, uh, I did find out about a U.S. drone base right at the top of uh, the state of uh, South Kordofan. Uh, you know, what they're doing, I mean, we can all guess what they're doing, I suppose. But there's, you know, a quid pro quo, it seems, going on. Uh, and it's very interesting that, uh, that while Samantha Power, for example, or, or um, uh, President Obama, seem to focus on, well, what's happening in the CAR, what's happening in Burma, what's happening in Syria. Very few people are talking about, number one, the fact that Darfur is now unraveling. There's a lot of killing going on in Darfur again. There are masses of refugees and IDPs in Darfur again. And now I predict, and I hope I'm wrong, that what we're about to see is a Darfur-type situation in the Nuba Mountains. I would say we've got to get tough with uh, Sudan and not just, not, I mean, I'm talking the international community, I'm not just talking about the United States. And you know, there's that whole issue, and maybe you brought this up this morning, unfortunately, I arrived late, but uh, the whole issue of impunity, uh, as you all know, I mean, the ICC, International Criminal Court, does not have a mechanism to go out and uh, arrest those that they serve uh, uh, arrest warrants for. Uh, and Nations that have, signed, that have that have are signatories to the uh, Rome Statute, which 
founded the International Criminal Court are expected to arrest anybody who is wanted by the ICC, and yet al-Bashir has traveled, the last time I counted, to something like 15 to 16 different countries where he visited and uh, left. So in that regard, I think, hey, there's a lot of talk about, well, this is what we need to do, but there's not a lot of action. And I would also say, again, that uh, what we need to do if we're serious about this is uh, do the work, uh, support the work of, of groups like Human Rights Watch. I mean, I don't know if it was mentioned this morning, but, uh, you know, there were distinct points where Human Rights Watch said the extremists are carrying out uh, test massacres in Rwanda in, uh, I think, late 92, 93, 94, uh, and Alison DeForge brought this to Congress, brought this to the United States government, and then the United States government has the uh, audacity to say, well, we didn't know what was happening. Um, I guess the question is, how do you move a government, any government, that is wedded to realpolitik to move towards prevention of crimes against humanity before they become massive? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I've been wrestling with it, but I don't have the answer. That's for sure. Well, that is the question that we will um, take to the next part of our program. And, uh, and we hope we've inspired another generation of scholars to think about how they can begin to think about these questions. What are the steps that can be taken and should be taken by the international community? Um, in the meantime, I'd like to thank our very um, impressive panel for their contributions this afternoon.